Hi everybody, this is Monica Guzman once again coming to you live on a weekend. Um, so Ty Cobb passed away July 17, 1961. So it's a wonderful opportunity to remember American baseball's prince. Uh, he was also known as the Georgia Peach. And he ended his career with several baseball records to his name. He, um, he was a rough character for sure. Um, but the way he's characterized um, after his death by Marxists in MLB is indicative of what's going on in America in 2021. So why is Ty Cobb vilified and steroids, Barry Bonds still revered, for example, by the MLB community that's Marxist, as well as the African community? Ty Cobb had problems for sure, but he didn't enhance his performance and he didn't, um, the things that he did were out of a competitive spirit. He wasn't cheating. He was pushing the boundaries basically. And the fact that he's white or just American obviously doesn't help this case because what's happening right now, again, is there's an effort to turn over the country. Um, so it's been an, an exciting week and even tonight has been eventful. So some of you may have heard that there were gunshots outside of the National Stadium in Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. is run by an African, an African female. So you can't be surprised, right? Given all the riots, the BLM riots that occur in D.C., given that it is concentrated by white liberals, you can't be surprised that eventually the violence was going to spill over into public venues. I personally tweeted out when the riots broke out in May of last year, I expressed concern for the MLB players um, during the riots for stadiums that were within walking distance, within street level. Um, I expressed concern. And so tonight we see that I was right. There was a drive-by right outside the ballpark. Um, but given that it's DC, given that it's run by an African mayor, and then given that there's just so much BLM activity over there, you can't be surprised that the violence finally spilled over onto MLB territory. And um, I'm not going to keep an eye on the reports. I'm not going to do play by play on that event. It happened, it's violence, given the environment, you cannot be surprised um, that it's finally come to uh, MLB territory. But it spills over into what I was going to talk about tonight anyway. And so so this week, the, the illegitimate, uh, the, gov the American government isn't run by Americans anymore. So it's illegitimate. And if you start, something that I'm going to encourage people to do is to look at the origins of a lot of what's happening right now. So I contend that America completely lost its country in the 1960s. Uh, but it, it started as of about 1934 when the concept of GDP was introduced. And so I started to look up the origins of things. For example, simple stuff like what's the origin of internships? That's something that started in the 1960s. 
And then I looked up the origin of the word racism. And then when I look up these kinds of concepts, I want to know the first time a word or a phrase was used. That's how I found out about this Judeo-Christian nonsense. Um, basically, Judeo-Christian is a phrase that came out of the early 1900s, not out of American history. Therefore, it's just a bunch of nonsense that was made up by the Jewish community, probably out of the critical theory crowd. Another one, again, racism. So I looked it up. And I want to share what I found on the origin or the first time that the word racism was used. Um, let me find my page. Again, it's sometimes I think these things are going to be linear and then stuff happens and I'm just because everything for me ties in together. And so I've got a little sidetrack with the, with the unfortunate drive-by shooting that took place outside of the, the stadium for the Nationals. It's, um, I mean, are we surprised that the, um, the violence is gonna start spilling over that way? I mean, It's just, I mean, I don't know. So I'm looking for the specific why well, the first use of it, at least on American soil. So I can't find it, but here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna to read to you what I found. While well, 19th century racism became closely intertwined with nationalism, leading to the ethnic nationalist discourse that identified race with the folk, leading to such movements as pan-Germanism Pan-Turkeyism, Pan-Arabism, Pan-Slavonism. Medieval racism precisely divided the nation into various non-biological races, which were thought to be the consequence of historical conquest of, and social conflicts. Okay, so Michael Foucault traced the genealogy of modern racism to this medieval historical and political discourse of race struggle. According to him, it divided itself in the 19th century according to two rival lines. On one hand, it was incorporated by racist biologists and eugenicists who gave it the modern sense of race and they also transformed this popular discourse into state racism and the example he gives is Nazism. So why was Ty Cobb the most popular American baseball player in the early 1900s, so popular that he garnered the most votes out of the first five that went into the American Baseball Hall of Fame? Because at that time, America was... American and it was Christian. It wasn't what it is as of the 1960s when you have the Jewish population teaming up with the African population. That's why American baseball became MLB when it got integrated because you have the Jewish community, which is only 1% of the population, teaming up with Africans. And Credit where credit is due, the Jews figured out how to enter every facet of American life that has authority. So they're all over the government, right? They're married to people who have power. So like the Kamala Harris marriage is like, 
I mean, super shady. She doesn't have children. She has a stepdaughter with this man who happens to be Jewish. And then apparently all the Biden children are married to Jewish. You've got Biden kneeling to the new prime minister of Israel when Biden is supposed to be Catholic. So why was Ty Cobb, again, why was he the most popular baseball player? He wasn't necessarily, I'm not going to say he was the most loved, but he was definitely admired. And he was definitely popular enough to garner all but four votes to get into the first Hall of Fame. And it is pointed out by many that he outdid Babe Ruth. And Babe Ruth, you know, was a, a, a different type of baseball player for sure. But nonetheless, he, Ty Cobb, beat out Babe Ruth, which is an impressive feat. And so, again, Ty Cobb, the most popular baseball player in the early 1900s, through his death in 1961, sailing along in his country, an American, his father was a prominent figure in Georgia. Um, and yet somehow something changed, right? Something changed. You've got, you know, it's so unfortunate that we missed out on Ty Cobb's autobiography the way Ty Cobb wanted it. All the writers that he was he kept lining up died before the project could be completed. And it's so unfortunate that he ended up with this jerk stump to write it. And then this loser just bashed Cobb's character and then you have a Jewish member of Hollywood who decided to make a movie out of that version and then you've got a movie bashing Ty Cobb again and then you've got these MLB Marxists running around bashing Ty Cobb too but again I'm going to ask it one more time because I really want some of this stuff to sink in Ty Cobb passed away in 1961, and he was by all accounts a very popular baseball player, American baseball player, who was admired by the baseball sphere and Americans. So what changed? Obviously what changed is that Americans lost their country. And then you've got the Jewish community running around American soil calling whites Nazis and racist. So the tide turned. That's what critical theory is. Critical theory aims to overthrow the majority. I've mentioned this several times. They can cross the border over to Mexico and do the same thing in Mexico. Critical theory propagated by the Jewish community seeks to overthrow the majority. I don't know if they're trying to turn the entire world Jewish. Maybe right now their target is simply the West because I don't know what they're going to do against the Arabs if, if they ever try to walk into the Middle East, which they technically are, right? That's why the American military has been in the Middle East for the last 20 years is because the Jewish community figured out how to finagle the military over there. Basically, the American military is fighting their battles, right? So maybe they do have a plan against Muslims and Arabs and all that jazz. So Ty Cobb, I believe, is the first American baseball player to blatantly be attacked. And because American baseball lost its popularity on American soil, nobody bats an eye. And... So I come along, and the reason why I'm doing this again is because I love baseball. And I love sports. And when I started to notice this stuff, um, like NASCAR and Danica Patrick, and then I saw what Friedman, Caston, Mark Walter did with Curtis Granderson, 
I realized that there's a pattern. And honestly, when I started doing this project, I thought that it was just going to be a group of nerds in MLB who are doing nerd things and ruining this game. I never thought that I would be digging back into baseball history and unearthing things that are of importance to other people. Again, I'm just offering a perspective from baseball, but it ties into everything else that's happening in this country. And so why is Ty Cobb attacked? Why is Cap Anson attacked? They're trying to cancel Babe Ruth. They're not attacking him because he's still, America, too many Americans still associate his greatness with the Yankees organization. And he was just such a larger than life character that you can't cancel him outright. It's again, it's like Tom Brady. You can't cancel Tom Brady outright. Um, so the reason why Ty Cobb gets attacked is because there is a Jewish community on American soil that has worked its way into all of the departments of authority on this country from the government to corporations to professional sports and they are carrying out their agenda and for them anybody who's white is basically a Nazi. So let me carry this further. On the other hand, Marxism also sees this discord founded on the assumption of a political struggle that provided the real engine of history and continued to act underneath the apparent peace. Thus, Marxists transformed the essentialist notion of race into the historical notion of class struggle defined by socially structured positions, capitalist or proletarian. Um, okay. So they're getting into some Arab stuff, which is not my focus. So the concept of racism was brought to American soil by the Jewish community. That's why Americans on their own soil are called racist. That's why whites are being turned against whites. That's why minorities on American soil are being turned against white. It all starts with the Jewish community. And so given the events of the week with the Biden administration admitting that they're using social media to control speech, uh, to control the narrative, to control information. Just people, you need to, uh, you need to address this stuff locally. Everybody isn't on social media. I think a lot of people are on Facebook, but the war isn't being fought online. The war is going to come to you in real life. And that's what you need to be preparing for. Now, if you can only relay your messages to people through online means, then you're not accomplishing that much. There are people on the right that just talk and talk and talk and talk. But I've, I've looked at them and I say to myself, okay, what have they accomplished besides just talking and podcasting and tweeting? They haven't accomplished anything. For example, two Republican representatives, one from Georgia, one from Florida, decided to go to California and they're having some sort of rally that that obviously got canceled by three venues where they attempted to hold it. I don't know how it turned out. I don't understand why a representative from Florida and a representative of Georgia decided to come to California. I mean, maybe there's something Republican going on. 
why aren't they in Florida and Georgia handling stuff that's happening locally? I mean, I understand that DeSantis is doing great stuff in Georgia, so maybe the Florida representative is useless. But as far as the Georgia representative goes, that's the capital of strip clubs. And maybe she should be more focused on what's happening in Georgia as opposed to what's happening in California. My belief is the fact that rural California is the one guiding the, the, the conservative movement right now, which is outstanding. I think that poses a threat to their agenda. And that's where this stuff gets really stupid. Let rural California is responsible for getting the recall election scheduled against Gavin Newsom. There's no need for a representative from Georgia or a representative from Florida to get involved in anything that's happening in California right now. If rural California votes for Caitlyn Jenner, which I highly doubt, then that's the fate that we deserve in California because we haven't gotten it together enough to push Bruce Jenner to the side and find a better suited candidate to replace Gavin Newsom. Mind your own business and not, not just mind your own business, accomplish things on your own backyard. Georgia is having all sorts of issues with Ballot counts. Why is the representative from Georgia and California? Go back to Georgia. If you want to feel needed, if you want to feel like you're accomplishing something, do it in your backyard. Everybody needs to become a better member of their own community, the community where they live, the community where they grew up, the community where you call your primary residence. That's where you need to be focusing in light of the censorship and the banning that's going to come at the order of the Biden administration. Go mind your own backyard, right? This isn't the time for national movements. The battle isn't going to come nationally. The battle is going to come to cities to counties, to neighborhoods, to regions. Stick to your own region and get your stuff done there. When I see right-wing influencers only being effective online, what it makes me think is that your community rejected you. And that's why you go online to find a place to call home, right? Because if you're getting stuff done in your own community, that should keep you busy enough and that should be carrying out your agenda amongst your peers, amongst like-minded people that live, that are your neighbors. I personally am trying to be a member of my community and I can tell you that it's good to understand the different personalities that live in your community, the different types of concerns that are floating in your community, the different types of um, just the people. You know what I mean? We all, I guess we all live in more diverse communities now. Um, the best thing you can do is stay in your backyard and get stuff done there. Now, this all ties into my topic of Ty Cobb. Something else that I want to throw out there is something that I've already thrown out there before in one of my first streams. So Ty Cobb's mom murdered his dad. Okay. I've tried to read a few accounts of the incident and I can't reach a conclusion as to why that happened. Um, Ty Cobb's dad was a prominent member of the Atlanta community, Royston, Georgia, I believe. And 
his mom seemed to be a good wife. Um, so from my understanding, Ty Cobb's dad had gone off on business, but he returned early. If he was sneaking around the outside of the home for whatever reason, and Ty Cobb's mom was startled, she used the gun that he gave her to protect herself. So she was simply protecting herself, and that's how the jury swung. Um, now, was she cheating on him? Uh, did he think he was cheating on? Did he think she was cheating on him? I mean, what's I personally am not going to litigate that because Ty Cobb lost his father days before he got called up to the big leagues. So if anybody has the right to have mental health problems, it was Ty Cobb. So something that I've talked about is the mental fragility of the American male in 2021. So you've got MLB celebrating people plagued with cancer, people plagued with other diseases like Lou Gehrig's disease. Now they're celebrating somebody who tried to commit suicide. So what's, what is that going to do? So if people are so influenced by what they watch on TV, they're going to be influenced by this one-eyed coward who tried to take his own life and survived it. So you have to look at this. Again, so what is MLB doing? MLB is throwing out their ugliness, poor health, poor mental health, domestic abusers, steroid users, cheaters. And what they're doing is they position these people for you to worship them. So Alex Verdugo, Julio Rias, Gabe Kapler, um, Aroldis Chapman, Herman, something. So all of these guys have done something that Americans wouldn't do or that Americans didn't do in the past. At least American baseball players didn't do. And if they did, they were kicked out of the league. So, so MLB's got, again, they are pushing forward now a coward who tried to take his life. And now he's only got one eye left. Instead of letting somebody like that fade away into the background. Hopefully he won't have kids because those kids are most likely going to attain his mental health problems. Plus they're going to look at their dad and he's going to one day have to explain to them that he was a coward who tried to take his own life. So those kids are already going to be born into trauma and we've already got enough traumatized kids as it is. So I want to remind you guys from the textbook that I'm using for world history. So if you pick this one up, world history, fourth edition on page three, they talk about the first humans. Okay. So the earliest tool-making hominoid, hominid, that some people believe existed based on their research is Homo habilis. And they had a brain that was 50% larger than the human species that came before them. Now, Homo habilis died out. And they're estimating this was 1.8 million years ago. And then came Homo erectus. 
around 250 years ago, at the date that this was published, a third and crucial phase of human development began with the emergence of Homo sapiens. So these are three generations of humans. Each one of them died out. But what happened was one species of humans died out and a more intelligent one was born. Okay. So why was the American so intelligent, innovative, brave, courageous in the early 1900s? Because it took 300 years to mold that American. Now, it worked until you had other cultures settling into the United States too, namely the Jewish community. So you've got the Jewish community running away from the disaster they brought onto themselves in Germany. And with them, they brought critical theory, which they stole from Karl Marx. Plus, they've got this notion of calling white people racists because the Germans were pushing back against them. So that's how we started, that's how Americans started to lose their country, America. Because critical theory is the theory of overthrowing the majority. And namely, it's Jewish people overthrowing the majority of the countries where they infiltrate. Okay, so again, why does Ty Cobb get attacked by Marxists and MLB in 2021? And after his death, it's because Americans no longer run America. Instead, you've got a culture of people who have managed to work their way into positions of authority throughout the country, corporations, government, professional sports, and they are the ones who brought the concept of racism and races to this country. And they've successfully spread it out to the point where you've got whites who call themselves races. Okay. So is Ty Cobb a bad person? No, he's not. He's only a bad person in the eyes of Jews because Jews see whites as racist. And to some extent, they must still see whites as a threat to them. It's like they live in this constant fear that the boogeyman's still out to get them. As long as the white man still lives, there's somebody that can, that's going to get them. And it's dangerous for the rest of us, that's for sure. So a lot of what I'm doing is sharing with you the American baseball perspective. Because American baseball, definitely before integration, was American through and through. And this, again, this isn't about jock worship. I don't admire Ty Cobb as a jock. I admire him as an American. And I admire the same way I admire Walter Johnson, Honus Wagner, Christy Mathewson, Cy Young. I admire them as Americans, even Yogi Berra. Right, Yogi Berra was an American. Joe DiMaggio was an American. Nicky Nano was an American. DJ LeMayhew, Zach Greinke, Madison Bumpgarner, they're Americans. They're really great at playing baseball too. And so, um, let's see. And so, it's not about jock worship at all. It's about helping people who have already started to push back against what's happening to this country, 
have one more perspective on what's happening right now. And I, my contribution is reminding you guys about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Locke, Thomas Paine, Patrick Henry, uh, Ben Franklin. So helping you guys remember where you come from and what American ideals actually are. So I read most of War on the Base Path, which is a biography on Ty Cobb. And I feel like what I've read so far is the most unbiased account of this man's life. Um, I feel he gives him a fair shake. I haven't gotten into the last chapters where I think he really tries to um, analyze Ty Cobb and the stories that were told about him. So for example, there are accounts on Twitter that tweet out historical pictures. And ever since I tweeted out that, so I purchased a book by a Jewish author. And the Jewish author doesn't come off very Thai cop friendly. I'm not asking people to whitewash stuff. But to continually repeat lies told about Ty Cobb, I personally reject that. And so ever since I tweeted this out, there are a couple of accounts on Twitter who are making it a point of finding stuff on Ty Cobb and tweeted them out to paint a negative picture of him. So Ty Cobb, there's a reason why this biography written on Ty Cobb in 2015 is called War on the Base Paths. Ty Cobb waged war on the paths. He really did. He was always looking to win. He was always looking, he, maybe he wanted to be the star. I don't think that's the correct way to describe it. But he, he um, took no mercy. He said that a baseball diamond was no place for molly coddles. Uh, it wasn't a place to drink tea. It was a place to carry a contest between men or among men on a physical level to see who would win. And Ty Cobb is by me, by no means, he was not a sissy, given the fact that he definitely could have leaned on his, on what happened to his dad alone. He could have, if there's ever could have been a spokesperson for mental health, it would have been Ty Cobb, given the fact that he lost his father at such a young age and in the manner that he lost it, Ty Cobb could have leaned on mental health, but he didn't. Instead, he pushed through it. Um, so something that Ty Cobb was quoted as saying is the base, base pass belonged to me, the runner. The rules gave me the right. I always went into a bag full speed, feet first. I had sharp spikes on my shoes. If the baseman stood where he had no business to be and got hurt, that was his fault. And so look, how is that different from what they did a cute few years ago with the neighborhood rule or whatever it's called, where second basemen or shortstops were blocking the path of the runner coming into second and getting hurt? Whose fault is that? Or especially right now with these minor leaguers that aren't being taught how to run the bases, they're standing in places where they're not supposed to be standing as when they're fielding and they're getting run over. Um, and again, you the Buster Posey rule, right? If a catcher decides to block the plate in order to stop the runner from scoring, 
he knows that there's going to be a collision. I clearly remember Matt Kemp running over some catcher, and Matt Kemp was the one who got the fine. But Matt Kemp said, you know what? I was running the way I was running because he didn't want to get injured again. So we've, well, they have sissified American baseball, MLB, which is now known as MLB. And because there's so many Marxists running around because it's the Jews running baseball and the teams, and they come from a place of critical theory and calling white people racist. They attack Ty Cobb and Cap Anson long after they passed away because nobody right now is supposed to be defending Ty Cobb. Nobody right now is supposed to be defending Cap Anson. And it makes sense. Yet they underestimated the American population. They, they overestimated the efficacy of their agenda. They underestimated that some Mexican girl born and raised in America would be like, what the fuck, right? And that does not mean that they're not going to try to prevent this from happening again in the future because the targets... We're not the targets. The targets are definitely our grandchildren. So a lot of the stuff, this overrepresentation of Africans and commercials, advertising, TV movies, uh, TV shows, Hollywood blockbusters, the overrepresentation of Africans isn't meant for us. It's meant for the future generations because if they watch this stuff 30, 40 years in the, in the future, they're going to believe that Africans founded the USA because they see them on TV, they see them on whatever electronic devices they're using to watch this stuff. And if you don't pass this stuff down to your children, that 60% English founded the United States, and there were some French, there were some Italians, there were some Spanish, uh, Germans, Irish, Scottish. If you don't pass this down to them, all of this American history is simply going to fade away, and there will be no need for a civil war because the future populations will be programmed to believe that Africans always ran the United States. And so you want to be useful instead of spending your time trying to grab power, trying to form these national movements that always end up crashing and burning. You can be useful to your household, to your neighborhood, to your community locally, then to your region, to your counties by helping pass down American history. I am helping pass down American baseball history because if there wasn't anybody pointing out this stuff, MLB would already be the Negro Leagues 2.0. Apparently, they're opening some stadium in New Jersey, and you better believe that that's just going to be Negro League all the way. Manfred was quoted this week as saying that He's going to get rid of seven inning doubleheaders and the runner starting on second, I believe, in extra innings. So he's going to get rid of the stupidity and he's going to go back to American roots. But the question is, is he going to go back to American baseball roots or is he going back to Negro baseball roots? My guess, because Robert Manfred is Jewish and MLB is run by the Jewish community. The teams are run by Jewish community too. My guess is that they're going to pivot toward the Negro League standard, which is not the American baseball standard. And I am more than glad that they'll go in that direction so that we can take the American baseball history stuff. Um, I mean, there's some guys that I definitely would want 
to take from them, meaning like Randy Johnson, Kurt Schilling, um, who else was pretty badass? Uh, Randy Johnson, Kurt Schilling, and there aren't too many others that I would want to take from MLB. Um, I can't think of any right now, but Randy Johnson would definitely want to take his stuff. Um, definitely Kurt Schilling. Um, everything else they can have. I mean, Pedro Martinez, Sammy Koufax. Pudge Rodriguez, Mike Piazza, whatever, take them. Barry Bond, Alex Rodriguez, David Ortiz, whatever. <laughs> All those other guys that they're just whatever. Take your mediocrity and steroid users with you. But um, if there's a split, I definitely welcome it. Um, we're moving forward with this. It's just a matter of could there be a legal battle? I'm hoping that they'll just move on and um, leave the other stuff for us. So. Okay. So war on the base pass. Um, let me read a couple of things to you guys from the introduction of the book. Now, when I was in high school, our teachers would always put a question on books that we were supposed to read from the introduction, which was super lame because we were like, why do you want us to read war? And so, but the introduction to War on the Base Paths, I felt this gives a really good overview. And so I wanna read a couple things because I want you to know, I'm gonna point out as I read them, things that I hope you find interesting too. And there's also a description of Detroit. Um, and I would like you guys to remember what these American cities were like before they got taken over, before Atlanta became the capital of strip clubs and before Detroit became a slum. Um, okay. Now, this first part of the introduction is interesting to me because if you know American baseball history, you can spot the events and the areas where MLB is trying to re-engineer to, so they're re-engineering moments in order to erase the past. So do you know that Ty Cobb was involved in a 14 inning game and I believe he got the hit, but they didn't win the game. So really 2018, that 14 inning game with Max Muncy, I mean, it's just beyond pathetic. It's beyond pathetic. It's basically what Hollywood is doing right now with all their remakes. They're not remaking movies for you to like them. They're remaking movies for your grandchildren to watch. When they remake, or like these live action movies, when, when Ariel is an African girl, as opposed to the Disney version where she's clearly white, they're trying to erase the white Ariel, and they're trying to replace her with the African Ariel for future generations. Because this is about erasing you. So let me read this to you and then I'll, I'll expand on it. Off in the distance, a swell of commotion attracted onlookers and the spectacle likely resembled the circus. Regulars to the Northern California course were sidetracked by the unusual display, especially for a Sunday on the links. All the attention seemed to be centered on one man. And, the, and to the uninformed observer, the individual was not unlike many others playing golf that day. He was in his mid to late 40s, balding, and slightly overweight. In fact, nothing was particularly exceptional about him. 
visually speaking. But for those crowded around the man, wearing except, exceptionally large smiles and hoping for an autograph or handshake, they understood his significance. They realized they were around American sporting excellence, a one-of-a-kind legend that had cemented his place in the annals of Major League Baseball history. Their focus was none other than Tyrus Raymond Cobb, a 24-year veteran of the national pastime. On that day, February 2nd, 1936, the news broke that Cobb had received the largest amount of votes for modern inductees into the newly fashioned Baseball Hall of Fame, soon to be open at Cooperstown, New York. He was essentially chosen number one by writers over all his contemporaries, including Babe Ruth, Ponis Wagner, and literally thousands of other players. The 222 votes in his favor were just four short of unanimous, clearly indicative of widespread esteem, and sports writer Dick Farrington, amongst others, wondered how it happened that four experts overlooked him. Now, this scene, there's two scenes here. There's the golf, and then there's the voting. So there is one MLB player or former MLB player who seems to take a lot of pride in playing golf. So here you have Ty Cobb who played golf. Babe Ruth played golf too. And when he was spotted in Northern California at a golf course, people flocked to him. And I've heard this story re-engineered for this former MLB player. And I mean, come on, like, it's just, Come on, dude. It's like pathetic. You're trying to re-engineer American baseball history in an effort to erase it. And when people figure out what's going on, the one that looks pathetic is you, not the past. Basically, nobody in MLB will ever have an original career, like Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron is just a compiler. Hank Aaron spent his baseball career trying to outdo Babe Ruth, and in the process, only won one championship, had like 3,000 more at-bats, I believe, and we're supposed to fall over ourselves for Hank Aaron. I don't think so. The second part of this is the fact that Ty Cobb wasn't a unanimous uh, entry into the Hall of Fame, although he was the largest vote getter. Now, is Mariano Rivera a Hall of Famer? I'm not sure, I haven't gotten to him yet. But the fact that they think Derek Jeter's a Hall of Famer is laughable. Um, but they made a big ruckus over the one person that didn't vote for Jeter. So what they're trying to do is get over the hump of the greatness of Ty Cobb and the admiration that the sports writers had for him and the fact that he was only four votes short of getting in unanimously. So they're trying to replace what happened organically with an engineered narrative, like mediocre at best, Derek Jeter. Um, again, I'm not sure how I feel about Mariana Rivera. The, the, the concept of the save is a Jewish concept, just like the designated hitter is a Jewish concept. So I'm not sure how I feel about Mariano Rivera. Um, I know that he's a Trump supporter. I know that he's a religious man. But the way I don't 
the fact that Albert Pujols, Adam Wainwright, um, and who, whomever else is involved in char charitable efforts, that just doesn't change my opinion about how these guys perform on the field. Uh, Adam Wainwright can do all the charity he wants, but it doesn't change the fact that he's a cheater. Uh, Albert Pujols can do all the charity he wants. It doesn't change the fact that he's just a compiler. Um, who else? I can't think of others, but, um, but okay, let's move on. Cobb, who was in the midst of a golfing round when informed of the balloting results, told a reporter, I deeply appreciate the honor. I am overwhelmed. I am glad they feel that way about me. I want to thank them all. I played very hard, applied myself, and tried to do my best in every case. Playing hard was Cobb's keystone to success, and his intensity was visible on the field from his earlier games in a small town, Georgia, until his final big league appearance seven years and five months before. Understandably, the image of the ex-ball player on the golf course in 1936 was a distant reality from the energetic and brawny competitor lighting faith pass on fire during his prime. But even all those years later, Cobb continued to live and breathe the sport. Baseball was in his blood, and the honor bestowed upon him was a fitting acknowledgement of extraordinary dedication to the game. As amazing as it might sound, when exalted Georgia Peach retired in 1928, he had established 90 baseball records over the course of his career, creating a sphere of dominance that only he could claim. Cobb talked even Babe Ruth, who reportedly retired with 78 baseball records. Now, I personally don't pay attention to every single baseball statistic, even before the analytics. Um, I look at hits, home runs, stolen bases, batting average, number of games played, number of at-bats, and strikeouts as, um, as an equalizer. Like Derek Jeter, right? Derek Jeter is in the top 20 of a couple of categories, but he's also in the top 20 of strikeouts. Therefore, I disqualify Derek Jeter from the Hall of Fame. Same way I disqualify Jim Tomey, Reggie Jackson, um, whoever else is in that top 20 of strikeouts because it's just – it's nonsense. They didn't strike out in American baseball. So I'm holding them to the American baseball standard as opposed to the Negro League standard. So um, I tweeted out a lot about tie cup statistics already. That's I'm not really focusing on them today. Maybe I might bring them in a little bit tomorrow, but not tonight. Um, okay, so... So let me read to you some of the statistics anyways. As a member of the Detroit Tigers from 1905 through 26 and Connie Max Philadelphia Athletics 27 through 28, Cobb put up statistics that were simply staggering. He owned a lifetime batting average of 367 with 4,191 hits, 2,244 runs, 5,863 total bases, and 892 stolen bases. Um, so pretty great stuff. And he didn't strike out that often. Um, so on the base paths, he combined quickness and psychology to confuse op opposition players performing stunts that no one in the right mind ever conceived. And because of this, he got away with these peculiar maneuvers with great frequency. That included stretching base hits into doubles, running from first to third on bunts, and stealing his way around the diamond to eventually score a run. Stuff like this is important to know because we hear about Jackie Robinson stealing home, even though he was out. 
Uh, we hear about when they're trying to push the narrative on Mookie Betts about he stretches singles into doubles. What they're doing, again, is trying to erase the memory of the American baseball pioneers, namely the memory of Ty Cobb. But because all of this stuff is recorded, it's up to us to continue passing it down. Or at least sharing it. Sharing it um, because then you know fact from fiction or narrative from substance. Let's see. Pilfering home plate was also a specialty and Cobb managed to slip underneath the tag of a catcher 54 times in his career, the most in history. But when you hear about stealing home, you hear about Jackie Robinson, you don't hear about Ty Cobb. And obviously there's a reason for that. Um, Cobb's reputation wasn't as pristine as his statistics. And in his ever-determined fierceness, he did many things to get under the skin of both teammates and rivals. He talked trash on the field, which was part of his psychological campaign, slid into the bases hard, often to kick the ball free from the glove of defenders, and wasn't afraid to mix it up physically. So Ty Cobb, that quote from Ty Cobb, about he had sharp spikes. Now, I'm gonna tell you a story. This was during the World Series that had a lot of rain. It was between Philadelphia and another team that also wore red on their uniforms. So I was watching it. Uh, with some coworkers, but the coworkers were going about their business. I was also helping set up some stuff, but I um, I was actually watching the final out. I didn't watch the entire series because I wasn't interested in the Philadelphia team and I wasn't interested in the other team. Um, but I wanted to watch the final out and. My coworker said to me, do you know that there was a guy who used to sharpen his spikes in the dugout and show them to the second baseman, menacing him that he was going to use his spikes to slide into the base so he better watch out. And this is someone who didn't even like baseball. Like he couldn't wait to turn it off. And even he knew this story. So does some of the distortion come from Ty Cobb pointing out that yes, his spikes were indeed sharp. Are the spikes of MLB players in 2021 not sharp anymore? Because again, it just goes back to they are trying to attack this man solely because he's an American solely because he stands on top in so many of the leaderboards, at least in the statistics that matter, because he was almost voted into the Hall of Fame unanimously, because he was rough around the edges. If Again, if anybody had a right to claim mental health illness, it was this man who actually went through stuff. When it comes to tattoos, I oppose tattoos. I understand, I, again, I see a lot of more tattoos out in the community. And one day I'm gonna ask people why they did that. Are they gang related? Are they personal choices? What's the deal? But when I see MLB players covered in tattoos, it's an automatic signal that they're thugs. I mean, tattoos for Americans started back with World War I. And then we know that some of the, the people who, some of the men who were drafted were tattooed 
so that they could be identified in case something happened to them. So when I see some kid, some 19 year old thug in an MLB uniform covered in tattoos, I doubt he served in the military. So I doubt he earned the stripes. He must be a thug then because the other relation to tattoos is gangsters or gang, gang related activity, right? So these kids who haven't earned their stripes are going around doing these things and MLB wants you to worship them. And that's exactly the reason why you shouldn't be worshiping them. So Ty Cobb used to try to kick the ball out of the catcher's hands. I guess he must have done it to the second baseman, maybe the third baseman, uh, the shortstop if he was covering, right? And so is, that's why they try to attack him in that sense. And again, up to the day that he died, Ty Cobb was admired. It wasn't until after he passed away that the attack started. And then they really started with the Jewish community and their movie and just the way that they don't honor his memory. So tomorrow, what I'm going to do um, is read more about Ty Cobb from this book, War on the Base Path. Um, just talk a little bit more about who he was, rough around the edges and all, um, the way he gets attacked and why we should actually be participating in keeping his memory alive. So I hope that you guys have a wonderful Sunday. Um, definitely stay safe out there. Definitely keep thinking about ways you can contribute to your community, be a member of the community, because what's coming next is coming quickly. And uh, we don't know how much longer we have online. So set up your in real life plans sooner rather than later in case you do get kicked off and have no means to communicate with other people. So I'm going to continue my Remembering Ty Cobb theme tomorrow, 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And again, I hope everybody has a wonderful Sunday. Thank you.